Um, I think we're going to start with Ben. Uh, many of us here are obviously focused on policy. We're in Washington. We're all tech policy nerds. Um, so let's just start with a broad question about how the White House is thinking about issues of uh, workforce and AI. Is it leaning positive, negative? What can you tell us about sort of the broad view? Yeah, happy to say a few words on that. Um, you know, as President Biden has said, obviously, AI brings with it enormous potential and promise as well as enormous risks. And I think that uh, with workforce in particular, that's where you really see a lot of that uh, come true. Um, AI has created a ton of uncertainty in the workforce, after all. If you look at, um, you know, if you look at opinion polling, there's something like I think four in 10 Americans who say that they simply don't know whether AI will help them or hurt them in the, in the workplace. And another uh, one in four Americans roughly express FOBO, which is a uh, fear of becoming uh, obsolete. Uh, so, you know, given that, obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot that we don't know. But I, I will, you know, say a little bit about how we're thinking about uh, the benefits and risks, at least at this stage. Um, and this obviously was a big part of, you know, the executive order on AI that President Biden signed last year, which really stands up for workers and tries to deliver you know, key protections that they need to be empowered and, and to thrive in the uh, in an economy where AI is more widely deployed. Uh, so thinking, you know, on the benefit side, obviously, you know, there's ways that AI can can automate, you know, certain tasks that are rote or mundane or, or less interesting to workers in ways that improve their lives or, or make them more productive or, um, you know, allow them to, to spend their time doing other things that are more engaging parts of their job. So if you look at healthcare, for example, um, you know, when the hospital staff see a patient, there's dozens of forms or over a dozen forms they will typically need to fill out on average. And there's ways that AI can be used with appropriate oversight, of course, to, to bring data from you know, one form to another, from records to you know, one record to another, um, and fill in some of that content, the ways that allow hospitals to have to spend more time actually seeing patients. There are similar examples in the education space where you know, the, the Department of Education had a really good report out last year that explains some of the ways that AI shows potential, at least, to help teachers with um, lesson planning and with tasks like that. That'll free time up for you know, them to spend more time uh, with one-on-one -on -one engagement with students. Uh, so those are some of the benefits, of course, but there's a large set of risks as well that we're, we're very focused on. And I think that you know, there's really two categories I'd highlight uh, in terms of where I think that the risks break out. Uh, so the first is risks to the quality of jobs that exist today. And then there's obviously a set of risks around you know, job displacement or, or labor, uh, labor disruptions. So with the job quality risk, I think that's really where we, we are certainly seeing these risks manifest today in certain parts of the economy, kind of all over the country. Um, and where we're also seeing workers, including through, you know, collective bargaining efforts, take important steps to address these risks. Um, so we, we hear a lot about this, um, this set of risks from the, the conversations we hold with workers, from civil society, uh, organized labor, groups like that at the White House, uh, through conversations and listening sessions, uh, which highlight, you know, with call center workers, for example. We've heard about times when um, AI or automated prompt generation tools generate inaccurate responses to customers' questions, but those you know, workers are still you know, responsible for giving those responses, which uh, creates worse customer service outcomes for everyone. Um, we hear similar risks from you know, on a wide variety of fronts from automated surveillance tools, including risks to privacy, uh, risks to workers' freedom to organize, uh, fair pay issues if workers are not, you know, the amount of time that they're working isn't adequately captured. So those are all things in the job quality space where, again, we're seeing you know, those things really happen today. And again, it's important to be taking steps to address those uh, quickly. Um, on the displacement side, I'll, I'll just say quickly, you know, that's a set of risks where I think that in the near term, at least, we think that AI is more likely in general to, to change jobs rather than to displace them entirely. Um, but there are, of course, exceptions. And, you know, some occupations might be more at risk than others. And that's certainly somewhere where we are uh, watching very closely to what's going on in the labor market, as well as, you know, watching the developments with screenwriters, for example, who recently negotiated key protections to um, prevent artificial intelligence from fully replacing, uh, you know, human script writers. Um, so those are all important developments that we're mindful of. Over a longer time horizon, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot more uncertainty. And we've seen in the past how new technologies can, you know, really change work and cause some workers to be displaced, even if, um, you know, um, they create new jobs in, in other domains. Um, but again, it's, it's hard to predict ex ante, I think, where exactly uh, some of these effects will occur. And a lot will depend, of course, on um, how, you know, the pace at which AI is adopted and deployed throughout the economy. And the last thing I'll, I'll say here, I suppose, is that I think all that said, it is really critical to be doing the work now to think about what are the supports that workers actually need, you know, from the federal government to make sure that they actually can share fairly in the, um, you know, increased productivity gains from AI and that they have the supports they need to, to thrive, you know, set up in advance before some of these changes may, have, may or may not actually take place. And... I mean, the, the AI executive order, you know, came out last year. Uh, 
when you were having conversations about the EO, obviously this technology is changing very fast. So how do you think about sort of future-proofing government guidance about something as dynamic as generative AI? Yeah, you know, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, and it's certainly a real challenge that we grapple with as policymakers. I, I don't think there's one simple answer to that. And, and developing AI policymaking, you know, as I think about it, it's an iterative process and it requires kind of multiple layers of overlapping governance mechanisms. I'll say a couple of things quickly. I, I think one is, you know, if you look at the approach the administration has taken to AI, you know, we started with, um, you know, we started with outlining a lot of the key foundational principles, such as, you know, through documents like the Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, through the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, through their AI risk management framework that really established kind of key, what I would describe as landmark or evergreen principles that, you know, the way that we apply them in the future might, might change, you know, in certain ways as AI is being used and developed and deployed in, in new ways. But I think that it's important to have that sort of really overarching risk management principles mm -hmm. going forward. The other thing I'll say too is, you know, again, agencies, including as directed by the executive order, and I can speak more about this later too, but they are certainly engaged in really in-depth study on a lot of these issues. So there's a lot more that we have to learn, I think, from the, the federal government, including as, you know, the Department of Labor and Council of Economic Advisors, they're, they're doing in-depth study on what potential, you know, labor market impacts might be in the future. And so this is somewhere where, you know, I don't want to front run anything that they, they might yeah. find, but we hope to learn more as well. Thank you. Um, Athena, I think I'll, I'll go to you for a sec. We talked um, last year about some of the AI uh, processes that Pepsi had already put into place, um, both in manufacturing, supply chain management, other business processes. So, you know, it's been a while since then. Can you tell us about some of the lessons learned about the AI implementations you've already done at Pepsi and what you might change or what you might add based on based on that knowledge? Sure. <clears throat> and uh, I'm not sure everyone understands a bit the footprint of PepsiCo, but just to, to explain the complexity, um, we are a 63 billion business in the U.S. I'm going to focus on the U.S. between our snacks portfolio, which is the Doritos, the Cheetos, the Lay's, our beverages portfolio, which is the Gatorade, the Pepsi, and of course our breakfast occasions with Quaker. Why I'm giving you this complexity? Because we do source to sell. And what does source to sell mean? We are one of the biggest agro companies in the world. So we have our agriculture and farmers. We manufacture our own products, uh, which means everything from the raw materials to the creation of the product. We do it ourselves. We move that product. So we are the second logistics, the second logistics provider after UPS in the US. Right? And then we provide those products to the retailers with our own people. So we sell that product as well. And we do also last mile delivery. So we impact every single household in the U.S. Plus we have almost 130,000 employees just in the U.S. Now, this level of complexity creates the following. We have the biggest cloud infrastructure, data infrastructure, and AI infrastructure than any other industry in the U.S. And that's not an exaggeration. Comparing to the second, which is Walmart, we are 30 percent bigger than Walmart when it comes to our data, cloud, and AI infrastructure because of that complexity in our supply chain. So back to your question on AI systems. For us, ut utilizing AI systems at scale is not a nice to have, it's a must have. Why? Because we need to ensure that we always have true efficiency when it comes to our packaging lines. We need to ensure that when it comes to health and safety of our people in our facilities, we drive zero accidents. Right? There is the less right level of quality and the uh, audit at everything that we do. We need to ensure that our truck drivers, that is one of our biggest unions and one of the biggest unions also in the U.S., use the AI technology responsibly also for uh, asset maintenance and, uh, and training and upscaling. And lastly, our salespeople are able to use AI for guided selling for both the consumers and, of course, whatever they do. Um, we have seen a couple of things so far in the implementation, which we are in, I would say, at scale of the third year of implementation. Um, one is improved productivity and efficiency from 10 to 70 percent. It varies depending on the area. Um, we haven't laid off anyone. I want to make sure this is very clear. For us, we're not using AI to optimize the workforce in terms of number of FTEs is to drive additional productivity and efficiency out of the existing workforce. 
That's why we have done an extensive upskilling, the scaling, the digital academy. We call it the digital academy, where kind of all our employees have been through waves of uh, uh, data, AI, digital training across every spectrum of technology and the practical application that we have done. Lastly, I would say the biggest risk for companies like us is not on the front line. I think people believe, oh, you know, companies like in the manufacturing space, who is impacted is the front line, eh? the person that sells or the person that manufactures. Actually, it's not that. It's financial planners. Right? Do you need to have as many financial planners when you have automated AI forecasts? Right? Do you need to have so many HR people? Uh, if you can do employee experience in a much more uh, digitalized way. So for companies like us, the biggest risk is in the knowledge worker base. It's not in the front line, uh, front line base. The front line, the NPS core and the adoption of AI systems has been off the charts. Um, and that's why it was critical. The use case is when we build with Vivian and Aspen is to, to hear from the front line on how AI is making their jobs better, more efficient and, and creates a better future for their families. Vivian, can you tell us a little bit about that project and what you learned? Yeah, yeah, it was fascinating. You know, I bring as a recovering journalist, I, I go into everything with a great deal of skepticism. Um, but I came out of this project as a, sort of a true believer in terms of the, the benefit, if done right, the benefit to frontline workers around AI adoption. So a couple of things that we discovered. First of all... And tell us when you did this. Sorry? What, when did this take place? Oh, in the past year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, look, we're still early days on this. I mean, one of the one of the things to keep in mind is the vast majority. Not everybody is PepsiCo. The vast majority of manufacturers are small players. They are not. They are really not far along at all, to put it mildly, in terms of their you know uh, AI automation adoption. Um, there are also very few sort of guidelines for manufacturers or companies in terms of resources to help decision makers and others. But here's what we know. We know that uh, AI deployment without worker involvement leads to not just, it's not just bad for the workers, of course it's bad for the workers, it's bad for the companies because it's lower job quality, it's reduced redemption, and it's reduced worker skills. So it, this is not, the, 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 the need for companies to do this is not about some kind of charity or kindness towards humans, it actually also has a bottom line benefit. And so, you know, our guidelines that we put out, which we're happy to share, focus on sort of reducing risk automation systems, upskilling workers and worker retention. And interestingly, um, we talked, Ben talked a little bit about sort of collective bargaining. This is an area where employee, you know, it, uh, uh, employers and unions are aligned because, or, or, or can be aligned if done right, if done right, of course, there are ways to do this wrong in terms of retention. So what's needed is leadership from, I mean, it's great that PepsiCo is leading in the space. We need more companies to influence this space because it will influence the entire uh, supply chain. We need employers to incorporate worker voices for job quality AI ad adoption. It's about job quality. It can't just be from the, from the manufacturer's point of view, the focus cannot just be on numbers and productivity. That will fail, it will fail for the company, it will certainly fail for the frontline workers. It's gotta be on job quality and will improve systems uh, all around. Um, those are sort of the top line. Yeah, absolutely. So in your line of work, you know, she just said not everyone is Pepsi. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in your research and the things that you worry about? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. It's great to hear that Pepsi is doing that. And I think that that's a good point to make a distinction between labor savings versus uh, efficiency, because there's a lot of uh, supposed labor savings that really isn't labor savings. It's just shifting the labor onto workers, and it's done invisibly. A clear example of this, and I'll take the federal government, um, at the same time that sort of some of the medical modernization was happening with digitizing medical records, there was a bill in the 21st Century Cures Act, which required that in-home supportive care workers had to participate in electronic visit verification system, which was basically going to document down to the minute or 15 minute increments how they did their work. And this would be determine everything from how, how much time they had 
to, or how much money, um, how much time they had to provide services to a client and how much time clients were allocated. The problem was the, the technology would say, you have 15 minutes to bathe, bathe someone. That sounds great. Most of us maybe take 15 minutes to bathe. The problem is you're bathing someone who is uh, disabled, not fully mobile, or has dementia. They are not going to as easily get into the tub or get out of the tub or even agree to it. So what happened was there was no opportunity for these employees or these workers to actually say, I need half an hour or I need longer. So what they would do is they would absorb that because they have relationships with their clients, with their disabled or, or, or senior um, care people. And so they would do that out of their own pocket and not get paid. So I think that there's a clear difference between how we look at data and what the impact of that. So now, had that been coupled with technology that helped someone get a person who was not immobile into the bathtub and out of the bathtub, that would have been great. So I think that we need to see that sometimes the costs of doing this work and sometimes that's risk as well is also shifted. Um, and another example is sort of the conversation over Uber and Lyft and how they're classifying workers as uh, independent contractors and not employees. That's another way of like shifting the costs of doing business, uh, uh, unemployment, healthcare, retirement, uh, taxes, everything is shifted on the employees. So I think there are different ways to look at that situation. Um, and I think, you know, if that were the case, we talked about the Screen Actors Guild. Part of their concern was that the industry was changing broadly. The residuals they were receiving from a lot of their work was not what it used to be. So the shifts may be in the task, but maybe in the industry as well. So to kind of go back to your your the question for um, Ben about where can government really provide guidance and assistance and to think more broadly about not just the reskilling, but sort of how an entire industry is changing and the business model for that and making sure that um, worker protections are part of that because some of this is like, this is not new. Misclassification of workers is not new. It's been happening for a very long time. How do we strengthen those protections? Because technology can often offer a rhetorical argument for changing work that may actually not materialize on the ground. Is there anything specific you would point to that you'd love to see the government doing right now to sort of set some of those protections in order? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the things that California has uh, started to adopt and it still needs improvement is um, California is, has a Consumer uh, Data Protection Act, but it, it, it until recently it didn't apply to workers and it only applied to consumers. And it takes a very consumer perspective. You are a consumer you have the right and the, um, the, the choice to not use something because you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. When you're a worker, that really isn't the case. If your boss is, comes to you and says, you must use this app for tracking the metal Google equipment that you're responsible for in a hospital, you can't say no. And then there's a legitimate reason for that, right? You don't want contamination of equipment, but you can't say no. And that equipment is attached to you. So it is tracking you as well. Um, and it could require fingerprint, iris scan, face scan in order to access that technology. So there is no real space there to say yes or no and have control over that data. And it's also collective data that matters. It's not what you do alone that determines your workflow. It's what your entire um, staff does, all of the people. So collective data rights, I think, is one place that we can start thinking about. National privacy law, what a concept. <laughs> Maybe we can work on that. Uh, has really worked out in the past. Yeah. <laughs> that was a couple of state of the nuts go that that was the main topic of conversation. Oh, but yes. <laughs> um, does Athena or Vivian, do you have any response to to what she just said, based on just your experiences with researching and on the ground at Pepsi? Yeah, and for our workers, as uh, Vivian said, um, they have participated in the beginning, the design of the AI applications and the system. So it has been a much more collaborative approach. And I'll give you kind of the, would say the good and the bad throughout this yeah. process. Let's make sure we're uh, talking about the bad over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's on the good people are coming along in the journey. And therefore, you know, from the moment you have established the systems, they will use the systems, right? Now, on the other hand, it takes more time uh, because you, they have to be part of the testing experience, not just the design experience. Eh? Um, and we've seen, and I'll give one example of our drivers, right? It's uh, uh, the, current, uh, the current landscape and legislative landscape on AI when it comes to driving is very different in the US compared to the rest of the world. So we have drivers in, the U in, uh, in Europe 
that they are more than happy to have cameras looking out and in, right? So forward facing cameras and inward facing cameras, right? For safety reasons, et cetera. Are uh, unions in the US said, no, yeah. we just want cameras facing outside. Absolutely fine for us. I mean, we respect that. I mean, we still manage to improve kind of the safety when it comes to the f- periphery of the vehicle and the predictive asset maintenance. Um, if they don't want to use other cameras, I mean, we make sure that the conditions are being tracked within the, the, the track in a very effective way, but we don't capture the biometrics. Uh, but that's a choice. I mean, we are not forcing the employees in this case eh, to have one single approach everywhere we are. It is so they can opt in or opt out. Um, but what we are trying to do in the lack of rules and guidelines and regulation, we have to create those with our employees. And this is kind of what our ask is, is uh, can we have some more, I would say, universal metrics, guidelines and frameworks and eventually regulation um, for us to be able to move as an industry much faster. Did you have anything to add? Yeah, just that I think that there's, you know, there are there are policy recommendations that could help, including, um, you know, establish a regulatory framework to incentivize companies to do this work. And the federal government, you know, has a role to play in terms of your procure- procurement processes are very powerful in terms of incentivizing those behaviors. So. You, you listening, Ben? Yeah, the, the, I'm taking notes. <laughs> yeah. It is, yeah. Um, is there, so Athena, it, so, so far, what have you seen out of the government, whether it's been in the executive order or a couple of proposals from Congress, obviously nothing has passed yet, um, and a couple, you know, guidances from different agencies. What has been useful so far and helped uh, Pepsi with its AI implementation? And what are you waiting on that would be like, absolutely critical yeah the the AI guidelines are very positive it's so it's a step to the right direction uh, for us and uh, i mean we, we were one of the companies that provided to nest when they had uh, of course kind of issued the rfp and uh, we had submitted that our own ai framework right so we contributed also to the to to the, the guidelines and, and the framework um, and we see that there is at least a bipartisan appetite uh, to find a way, I wouldn't necessarily say regulate AI, but providing at least some uh, approach on how to use AI responsibly. And um, we would like more of that. Uh, and eventually, um, you know, that would lead to maybe regulation in a couple of years, who knows? Um, but to do it in a much more deliberate way, what do I mean by that? You cannot regulate AI without having data privacy rules, right? I mean, you cannot say, oh, I want to have responsible AI systems and you don't have the equivalent of GDPR that there exists in Europe. So uh, there needs to be a roadmap of things that need to be established uh, that have to cut across governments and standards. It can't be every election we have it different approach and that will be super helpful for the industries so we would like consistency a, a roadmap that doesn't touch only the sexy part now which is ai but also goes back to the principles of how we all started which is data privacy and data standards and ben can you name any you know b- before the ai conversation uh do you agree that sort of baseline privacy and other digital protections would be useful to, you know, as a baseline before we start talking about specific AI regulations and, you know, can the White House push Congress to do something on that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, the president has been very clear in calling on Congress to act in bipartisan privacy legislation. It, it's long past time in, in our view that the Congress take the steps to do that. Uh, meanwhile, of course, the, you know, President Biden is doing you know everything he can in his administration to, to use existing authorities to protect Americans' privacy. And we've seen um, agencies take a number of steps to do that, but but to your question about the, the legislative side, I, I think that you know the president has been clear on that point. As I've said, I, I will also add that I think AI really does um, you know it it brings a lot of these issues with privacy front and center. I think for a couple of reasons, you know AI on the one hand it enables a lot of data collection and um, you know it enables abilities to draw, to draw inferences from new data in ways that make the consequences of of you know poor privacy protections uh, even more significant. 
um, based on the capabilities that it gives us, but it also expands the incentives, I think, for companies to engage in data collection in the first place, given what, what companies can now do with, with more and more data. It's, it's the issue of not just individual data, but, but um, collective data across large groups, as you said earlier. Um, so, so certainly, you know, privacy, again, I think needs to be front and center in this conversation when we think about AI as well. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you think, just as far as uh, what else the government can be doing uh, to be helpful at this stage? This is for me. Yes. <laughs> I thought it was like you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I think one of the things that uh, the government has started to do is the Department of Labor issued an executive order looking at how, uh, because it's the worker surveillance that leads to the data collection. And some of the that worker surveillance is, it's, it's just a camera. It's watching everything. It doesn't necessarily just say, I will only collect this metric. It collects much metrics, many metrics, and that can be repurposed in many ways. And so the executive order or the, um, the, the legal memo basically said, we need to make sure that this is infringing on the worker, on workers' rights to take collective action. And this kind of goes back and supports this idea of like making sure workers are part of the conversation early on. A lot of people are talking about how workers have to participate in, in the deployment of technology, but we all know a frontline worker's opinion is not nearly as important as a CEO's. So how is the collective voice or, or what could amount to like one, uh, one, one suggestion could be like idiosyncratically applied. It'll, I'll apply it to you, but not everyone, or it will be a fix that's not long term. So I think that being able to put those protections in place so there's like a little more even level playing field in these conversations is important. Um, and I, I think, you know, just to talk about generative AI a little bit, um, writers and artists are very concerned because their work has already been scraped. Um, and so there's a lot of conversations happening around trademark, which is one step, but it's not the only one. I think um, I just had a, a, a talk last week with an artist, a rapper, an artist, and a model, and they were really concerned about the future of the industry because uh, some younger artists were thinking, does it even make sense for me to enter this occupation if my, if my work can just be scraped wholesale? So there has to be some regulations on the companies that are collecting this data, sometimes completely illegally, mm -hmm. even using the artist's name illegally and in, in, in yeah. committing fraud. So yeah, and that, you know, I'm sure we're gonna have a whole other panel on copyright and patents and trademarks too. as well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, I do want to leave some time for audience questions, but before I do that, I'd like everyone to tell me a thing they have found useful or hopeful about AI and something that keeps them up at night. And we can start with Vivian. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, a thing that is hopeful is that um, AI does not have to be instead of, it could be in addition to. And I think that that, that applies to so many things. Here we're talking about, you know, at least specifically the work we're talking about for frontline workers. It can enhance uh, worker job satisfaction and retention. And that is true not just for frontline workers, but for journalists, for, you know, for, for, for artists for you know those in any walk of life truly um the thing that terrifies me about ai is um well frankly this is this has completely got nothing to do with uh labor at all but that's okay a big part of the, the work that we do um uh, uh, separate from this project is related to the impact of ai on information integrity and um particularly in this year of uh of just massive global elections and there's a lot of risks there and I'm not sure either the tech companies uh, or governments or campaigns or election officials are, or even the media are completely prepared. Yeah, for, and I will talk on behalf of uh, our employees, right? Because uh, some of them said that you, you, have to, you have to voice kind of our opinion. And what I'm hopeful is it allows for career mobility. Is before if you were a merchandiser, you were a merchandiser. Before if you were kind of a warehouse manager, you were typically in logistics. Now you can go from sales to supply chain, from supply chain to finance, from finance. Because why? Technology allows you to do things that cut transversally, cuts down the functional silos that every organization has, and anchors everyone around the outcome. So now, suddenly, we become an outcome-driven economy. 
an outcome-driven company, and not a company that thinks within the functional capability, a business model that companies used to have for, you know, hundreds of years. Well, in terms of things that are, are particularly exciting, you know, I, I flagged a few of um, those things before. Certainly, I think in, in some industries, such as, you know, healthcare and education, as long as we can get the risk mitigations right as a, as a prerequisite, you know, I think there are really exciting uh, potential upside use cases that, that do excite me. I think, you know, in, in um, AI's applications to science more broadly, in terms of expanding the boundaries of what science can do, um, is also really uh, thrilling to, to think about. Uh, we already see AI being used in, you know, for example, to predict protein structures in ways that could lead to uh, new possibilities with drug development, which I, I think is, you know, would really be a collective benefit for, for humanity if we can, again, contingent upon mitigating the risks, capture those benefits appropriately. Um, in terms of things that, that keep me up at, at night, you know, this isn't necessarily you know, a terrifying thing, but, but just in terms of something that shows how daunting the task really is, you know, I think that you know, when I think about AI, it's it's such a cross-cutting area of policy right now. It really touches on everything that we we do in government, and it you know involves certainly almost every federal agency, if not all federal agencies, in terms of thinking about what the right approach to AI is. Uh, you know, there's there's a reason that the uh, executive order last year is almost twenty thousand words. It, it's so long because there's frankly so much to do. You know, both in government and and beyond government, and I think a lot of that obviously adds up to a pretty daunting set of tasks. Yeah. There's a, a great deal of work to be done, which which we've signed up to do. I'm I'm confident that we can do it, but but certainly, um, yeah, it makes you appreciate the enormity of the challenge. I will start with the nightmare first because I want to end on a positive note. <laughs> um, the other day, I was having a conversation, and someone was talking about how there's an, a movement in Iran for women to like remove the hijab because it's become a symbol of like control by very conservative groups, but every time she asked an AI, AI generator, I think it was mid-journey, to create an image of Iranian woman with, you know, freedom fighter, they kept putting the hijab back on, you know, regardless of what she did. So I think that there is this potential of AI just could sort of consolidate a particular image of people, even though we as a society are trying to evolve. So uh, that was kind of a little concerning because this is like a movement, a national movement. Um, but the positive is that she was also seeing new people creating new images and flooding this, the, the internet with more. So there is definitely a space to change that. And we, you know, and during the pandemic, even the idea of like a retail worker or a delivery worker became an essential worker. And they were able to use that moment to really um, change who they were. And a technology was a big part of that. It was a communications tool that allowed them to really change how they identified themselves. So that's yeah, positive. Absolutely. And with that, I'm going to open it up to folks in the audience who might want to talk to our esteemed panels. Any questions? Go ahead. My name is Derek Watt. I used to be an MP in England. If there was an AI council somewhere in the world, would America join it? Um, it's it's a little hard to, to <laughs> I, I was about to say it is it is hard to say without any more specifics. I think that what I what I can say though is, in, separately from the context of a hypothetical AI council, you know, it is very clear that um, you know the administration takes very seriously the need for engagement and cooperation with you know allies and partners in other countries abroad, and that you know certainly is a, a key priority in the executive order as well, which really I think sets up key next steps for the administration to, to do that sort of work in collaboration with others in key areas related to AI. So, you know, again, I, I, I won't speak to necessarily exactly what, you know, future structures of, of you know, a hypothetical AI council might, might involve or entail, but I think, you know, to get at the, the spirit behind your question, absolutely, um, it absolutely is a priority to be engaging and collaborating closely with, uh, with other countries in that respect. Go ahead. I'm Kathy Kahn, and thank you so much for this panel. I'm part of the group that founded ICANN, the Internet Corporation, for sign names and numbers, so it won't be stakeholder members. So let me, let me give you, let me draw an analogy and then ask the question. So we formed, when the GDPR was founded, we wanted to know what the implication would be on the global internet and the domain name system. And we formed a group with US attorneys and Europeans and international attorneys and others. And we mandated that everybody study a little bit about the GDPR before they walked in. It's not the easiest legislation, <laughs> and it's not what you think it is. Um, so now when we're talking about employee and worker involvement in AI decisions, 
what type of you know, CEOs and advisors and attorneys and data scientists, guys, you know, what background, what training should there be for the employees and the workers so that they can walk into the room and get a knowledge base? Yeah, and add real value to your customers. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Well, maybe I take that first and then, uh, yeah. Um, wait, firstly, let me say, my role was established because of that. It didn't exist in the organization. Let's start with that, right? So, and I report directly to the chairman and CEO, and uh, partly because we wanted to ensure that everything we do from a strategy to implementation uh, falls under one organization. So one is you have to start from the ex the organization. You need someone who wakes up every day and ensures that whatever we do strategically looks at all the implications of technology to the business and the strategy. So that's one. Second, um, my two greatest partners in the company is HR and legal. HR and legal. Legal. Legal, yeah. So our chief counsel and our uh, people officer is where we partner both in terms of upskilling and scaling on one, so we have the academy, we work with the HR, and legal, we have together established a responsible business framework for the company, which is being now, uh, which is being assessed by the board as it relates to AI twice a year and as it relates to other areas like cyber every quarter. So we have elevated the criticality of AI systems up to the board. So this is, this is overly important. The last part for me, which is the third pillar of the approach, we have employee forums. So I created what we call a digital ambassador community. These are people represented by all the different aspects of our business. And you will find there everyone who is um, a, a HR practitioner in uh, Guatemala, uh, to someone who is a truck driver in Oklahoma, to someone who is a salesperson in uh, LA. And they act like our governing council. So we meet every two months. They provide feedback on the design of the systems, on the build of the systems, on the adoption of the systems. And we use them as the change ambassadors. That's why we call them the digital ambassadors of the organization. And uh, every July, they co-present with me to the board. So when we do uh, talk about the progress uh, of our uh, both digital and AI, they call it that uh, with me in front of the board. So these are the activities at least that we have seen work for a company as complex and as global as PepsiCo. So everyone is part of the journey and contributes to the development and the uh, sustain. Oh, I'll just only add that, and this wasn't part of the work that we at Aspen did uh, specifically with PepsiCo, but we are focused on this work as are many others, which is the responsibility to up, uh, upskill the workforce, the future workforce, the potential workforce uh, for that very reason. And it begins with, um, you know, education, even in secondary school and uh, it is requires a multi-stakeholder approach, including for the corporations and the companies who are going to be relying on that future workforce to be knowledgeable and for the future workforce, particularly to make sure that they are prepared for the job. I'm going to say the jobs of the future, but really increasingly it's the jobs in, of the present. Uh, with a focus, I would add on making sure that we do this in a way that um, levels the playing with field, particularly for underrepresented communities. Thank you. It's now. There's a bunch of different uh, efforts around this that yeah that are that are either in motion or about to be started. Go ahead. Uh. All right, uh, Joel. Um, previously with Senator Round's office, um, I was I was curious. Um, you know, in the AI Inside forums that the Senate did, um, I think it was Darren Asimoglu who talked about you know the dramatic shifts that we're going to see in the employment and labor markets. And I wanted to understand. I mean, um, this question is especially for Ben. Uh, you know, do do you think that it would be you know more optimal to create more free choice for? Um, people in the labor market instead of going after, you know, more employment, more regulations for employers by basically decoupling things like healthcare um, and making it easier for people to switch jobs, thereby letting them choose from the companies rather than, you know, trying to dictate what companies have to do. Yeah, I'm happy to start. And it, it's a great question. Certainly familiar with Doron's writing and, and, and commentary on this, which is always uh, extremely insightful. I, what I will say is, you know, um, again, you know, I, 
the federal government and in particular places like the Department of Labor, Council of Economic Advisors really are doing the, the work to study in depth a lot of questions related to what you're saying um, in terms of what exactly the right support systems might be. And that includes looking both at, you know, support systems that we've had in the past, but also thinking about new possibilities as, as well, right? There, there's a lot to consider. Um, so, it, you know, again, I'm, I'm, you know, certainly don't want to front run a lot of the work and conclusions that folks that are really looking at this very in depth on a day-to-day -day basis are doing. But I will say that, you know, I, I think that, again, the president is very eager to work with Congress in particular on you know, these issues broadly. And he's, he's made that intention very clear. And these are things that once we have, you know, um, once we've completed the process of really doing that, that in-depth study, I think that uh, these are questions that I think we'll be able to have a lot more light shed on. There's a lot of possibilities to consider. Anyone else? Go ahead. Sorry, so for the um, National Democratic Institute, the Democracy uh, Quick question on uh, open source technology. Uh, what, what, is, what is your approach? Is that way the you know, executive board is kind of looks to be advanced because, to, you know, the approach is sort of capital state uh, around the world to AI? You know, I know that the EU had developed the latitude to open source technology. I was kind of curious to. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Other panelists might have views as well. But, you know, there's a lot of questions around open source. Um, as, as I think, you know, the executive order um, directs the Department of Commerce to be releasing a request for information on these questions. And I will say that, you know, public input on this question from, you know, academia, from, you know, industry, civil society, labor, you know, all sorts of stakeholders is going to be really critical, I think, for this and for other areas where the executive order directs uh, public input to be uh, solicited. Uh, so I, you know, um, Sorry, I, I apologize that I, I don't have a, too much more of a substantive answer to give at this time, but I, I, I do want to say that we recognize, um, obviously, there's a lot of questions around um, this particular set of issues, and it's one that I think we are thinking about very, very closely and working to get um, as much public input as possible uh, to, to get at these questions. Do we have any other questions? Going once, going twice. Joel? <laughs> oh. <laughs> no one's going to take you got three minutes. <laughs> Thanks. What one of the things um, that uh, what, one of the things that one of the panelists mentioned was was kind of this international view, talking about uh, women in Iran wearing the hijabs and um, you know how AI tools were kind of eliminating them. I think this is this is mostly focused on on, on PepsiCo, but um, I'd be curious if anyone else has a perspective of how how U.S. policymakers should think about. Um, or if there is a possibility of creating kind of our own domestic Brussels effect when uh, when we think about AI regulation, when it comes specifically to worker dignity um, and how companies are really going to deal with integrating these very different worldviews. I think, you know, I'd be very curious for, for PepsiCo. I mean, you're, you're a global company. Uh, I mean, you're operating in what, I, I mean, almost every market, including like Russia and Ukraine, right? Um, I mean, so I'd be very curious how you how you incorporate those very different moral views in your workforces across these different regions. Yeah. Great question, Joel. <laughs> no, wonderful question. And we are operating in every market in the world, yes. Uh, uh, including, obviously, markets that are in current conflict um, beyond the markets that you just referred to. Uh, that's why, for us, policies are local. Let's start with that. Uh, so we have standards, of course, that we as a company, we want to abide with. I, I mentioned some of the frameworks, but data privacy laws are, are different if you are in Pakistan versus India, are very different if you live in Saudi versus uh, Iraq, right? And I just used four markets that we have operations. Um, so one is we have locally uh, data privacy teams and data teams and technology teams that make sure that we adhere to those standards and we have uh, legal teams that do that. But at the same time, uh, what we want to ensure is that uh, for different types of legislation and regulations that go beyond just data, but uh, to your point, that's areas of dignity and human decency, we also abide with that. So I'll give you Saudi as an example. Eh? We are one of the few employees uh, that have a whole unit which is only females because they want, we want them to feel very empowered, right? And we have full factories, we have one facility that is run by females because we also want them to feel that they can run, they can be plan managers and not just secretaries, just to be very clear. Um, uh, we have uh, locations like uh, Vietnam 
uh, where because data privacy is super important, but there is no AI regulation, but we have given them the standards on AI regulation and AI privacy, and we said, why don't you stress test that based on the population and based on what you want to see in terms of application? So there is what we call freedom within a framework. We have the standards, we have the policies that we have. We've said, okay, regulation in local markets, this is what it is, so we have to abide. And then this is where we allow every market to play within the thresholds. Eh? Um, uh, for us, there is one element that you know, we always adhere, and in people's minds, we are an American company. Right? We are a global company, but we are an American company. So as every other American company, we can be boycotted, we can be uh, attacked, cyber attacked, et cetera, et cetera. But the one thing that we don't compromise is our employees. So the underlying principle is we need to protect our employees, we need to protect the privacy of, of our employees, irrespective of the situation or whatever happens in the local market. Thank you, Athena, and thank you to all of our panelists. We had a great conversation today. Um, and yeah, we got to wrap up. So thanks, everyone, for coming. We'll see you around. Thank you. Thank you.